Hello there, boys and girls, and welcome to another episode of Circling the Bases, proudly part of NBC Sports Edge. I'm your host, Colin Henderson. Joining me today, as always, Mr. Christopher Crawford. Chris, All-Star break is upon us, and we're going to talk about a bunch of All-Stars today, but let's let's at least start off the show with a little bit of just this home run derby field that's starting to that's starting to formulate together. We've got five of the eight or ten. I, I didn't even get a chance to see what the full list is or at least how much they're trying to build it out. I think it was eight last year. But so far, Pete Alonzo going for back-to-back-to-back titles, Juan Soto, Kyle Schwarber, Ronald Acuna Jr. If you're an NL East fan, you're having a great time. And Albert Pujols, which I am genuinely pretty pumped for. I mean, I I know Pujols might hit two home runs, and I'd still be totally fine with it. But (laughs) um, I, I, I was so pumped that, Someone age 40 plus is going to be in a home run derby. I think that's a lot of fun. Whose name isn't Barry Bonds. And I think that's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And it's, it's good to see Pujols going to, you know, the, to go play in the place that he got famous. We'll always think of Albert Pujols as a Dodger. We'll never yep. think of him. We'll never think that's of him exactly as a Cardinal or an Angel. Of, yeah, that's, it's, he is, <laughs> he is, he is Mr. Dodger, Albert Pujols. I think it's great. I mean, look, I think that guys like him and Miggy, who, um, you know, are Miggy's having a better season than I like it that I'm saying it like I'm best friends with the guy. Like I know him well, like him and Miguel Cabrera, you know, do they deserve to be on the all-star team? Probably not. Do I give two, you know what? Absolutely not. It's an exhibition game. Give me the most famous players at all time. But yeah, I'm excited to see Albert Pujols. And it would not shock me, especially because the one thing that guy still is, is strong. Wouldn't shock yeah, me if you put up never a, at a least a decent showing in it. Yeah, I agree. And look, I, I I feel like him being in there, I'm super glad to see Ron Lacuna healthy enough to be in a home run oh, derby this too. year. If you had asked me at the beginning of the year, I would have said you're no way. But like the fact that he's healthy enough to do it. Um, I mean, Alonzo going for back to back to back titles. Uh, his Crazy. third win would tie Griffey for the most home run derby titles. And he's 27 years old. I mean, we, we spoke a little bit. Uh, we spoke a little bit last year. Remember when he came out after the Derby? And it's like I'm the greatest home run hitter of all time. And we, we <laughs> right. Kind of sat here and I'm like, calm down, young buck. But I mean, hey, look, if he were to go back to back to back, that is a really impressive feather that no other major leaguer in history has ever been able to say. So that would be huge. Obviously, we need to fill out the rest of this grouping. Unfortunately, we know one name won't be on there, and that's Aaron Judge. And that's really the guy you want to talk about in this sure. 30 home runs at the All-Star break is just nonsense. So obviously he won't be a part of that, but however they fill this out should be good. Yeah, I mean, like you can't really go wrong here. I mean, I, I would assume so. I mean, assuming that we're not going to get like, uh, you know, Raphael Belliard or something like that in the home run derby, as fun as that might be for something like that. Christian Pache uh, is making the, Christian, making the Christian, rounds. Yeah, is hey, making the rounds to the home run yeah, derby. Yeah, at least, <laughs> at least Christian Pache's got some raw pop, you know. But yeah, at the same time, hey, you look, want that somebody doesn't have a slider. It's, there's a spin yeah, to it, right? Yeah, like it's, we can work yeah, it. exactly. But what I would say, uh, just real quick, I'll, I'll yeah, just yeah. give you my answer. I think you were going to ask me who's supposed to be in there. I just can't ever wait to talk about this guy. It's Julio Rodriguez. Put Julio Rodriguez in the home run derby. I think I mean, that'd be a lot that of fun. Guy, that guy's raw power and like just raw magnetism as well. It would be so fun to watch that guy in a home run derby. Um, but yeah, I mean, you there's three more to go. But if you, if you get if you can give me one of those spots for my sweet sweet Julio, I'd really appreciate it. I'd happily give it to you. Do you like? Do you prefer the? five minutes swing as many times as you want versus the 10 outs kind of old school style of, of doing this. I know that we were kind of talking a little bit pre-show just about like, maybe guys don't want to do this in the new format because there's so much more swinging involved where in the old format, it was genuinely like 10 outs and the home runs. You took like 27 swings. You know, if you got something good this time, you, you just hacking away. Yeah, I go back and forth on this. We Colin and I talked about it, and I wanted him to ask me the question and for me not to answer because I wanted some time to think about it. So the positive is I think it's a much better viewing experience for uh, for the fan mm-hmm. to have the time limit type of thing. Watching these guys take pitches and wait for the 10 outs and stuff like that, especially like if a guy has like a ridiculous round, I'm sorry, watching somebody hit 25 home runs is a lot of fun, but that 25 home runs might take a half an hour. And, yeah. and, and that and that is not great television, as fun as that is to watch. 
at the same time, I do think you maybe get more people to participate in it mm-hmm. if you go the other way around. Yeah. Because the stamina thing, these guys get worn out swinging maximum velocity so often. And, you know, this is supposed to be, you know what? This is supposed to be their vacation. It is <laughs> awesome to see these guys do well and want to participate in it. But I don't blame anybody for not wanting to take part in this to be, you know, uh, to take away from their, especially if it's a player who isn't actually in the all-star game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, that's always a weird, that's, yeah, that's it's always a weird, a weird little spot. Yeah, absolutely. And and for some players, they probably get a kick in it because kick out of it because it might be the highlight of not just their year of their career to get to participate mm-hmm. in it. I think I prefer the 10 minute format though, just because look, this isn't the dunk contest where it really matters who's participating in this thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Homers are homers. They're going to be fun to watch. So give me the one that is a little more uh, time efficient than, than the old version. Yeah. I'm with you on that. The time efficiency, the entertainment value, not watching pitches get thrown by and by and by while someone waits for that right pitch middle end. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. give me the swings, give me the stuff. I'm all for that. For sure. So coming up on the show today, Chris and I will play another name game, but this time we will do it with All-Stars. All-Star edition name game here on the pod. We'll be comparing players from both All-Star teams and who we'd rather have from a fantasy standpoint over the second half of the season. But before we get talking about those in the Midsummer Classic, we still have another game here on Peacock this Sunday before we get there. That's right. Weekends are better with MLB Sunday leadoff coverage presented by Uber Eats. Catch the Royals take on the Blue Jays in Toronto this Sunday at 1130 a.m. Eastern live on NBC and Peacock. To learn more, go to PeacockTV.com slash MLB. And if you want a chance to win 25K on the game, download the NBC Sports Predictor app powered by PointsBet and enter Sunday's free Grand Slam Pick'em contest. So let's get to some of those all-stars, the little name game out there. And honestly, there's because of the just dearth of talent that is available to us, I mean, we're going to get nitpicky. It's going to get weird. But, I mean, I think there is absolutely something to be said. And I, I was thinking about it before the show, just the number of players who – have all-star attached to their name and then proceeded to have bad second halves. Like they sure. earned their, they absolutely earned their right to the all-star team, but they just didn't, weren't able to carry that over throughout the course of the season. I think right. that's something to kind of look at here. And just in terms of, of like, look, obviously they made the all-star team. They were really good, but can mm-hmm. they hold this production for a long time? So sure. let's kind of get into that first. And let's start with Pete Alonzo, polar bear, who we were just talking about versus Freddie Freeman, the hometown guy out in LA now who will be, hosting uh hosting the all-star game with the Dodgers so Alonzo 271 with 23 home runs 72 RBIs just monster numbers for a first half 48 runs scored and two stolen bases with an 875 OPS Freeman with an equally as good 875 OPS but with only 11 home runs and 54 RBIs but beats Alonzo with a 304 average and 55 runs scored and seven stolen bases so Chris if given the choice from now to the end of the year, are you taking Pete Alonso as your fantasy first baseman or Freddie Friedman as your first baseman one? Yeah. So also the, the interesting thing here, and we're going to do this for a couple of guys, yeah. we're going to do some all-star snubs because Freddie Freeman that's is it. not on the all-star. That's right. I forgot. I'm the, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah. Um, we'll just, like, yeah, honestly, uh, you just assume that he's there for you as know what? long as I have. I was looking it's at so, else's it's so weird to see. And, and that's one of the reasons why I thought it was an interesting exercise just because there are some guys having incredible years that did not make the all-star yep. team just because there's no room. And to yep. be honest with you, you cannot argue with what Pete Alonso and Paul Goldschmidt have done at the first base position. That being said, if you're asking me to who I like for the rest of the season, oh, I'm going with Freddie Freeman and by a significant margin. I think Freddie okay. Freeman is going to be one of the true – stars of the second half of the season and the reason i say that is this little thing we call history because freddie freeman has been one of the best players in baseball and has crushed pitching in second halves of season i think people kind of forget that freddie freeman was having a good not great first half of the year last year and then just came on so strong in that second half of the year we saw it with his mvp year of course even saying there was a first and second half of the season. We'll just call the whole thing a second half of the season because it was only, only, <laughs> only 60 games, and it was take a place after July 15th. So, yeah, um, 
I, as much as I like Pete Alonso, there are going to be too many times where the average is going to fluctuate. I can count on Freddie Freeman helping in four, maybe even five. Those seven stolen bases you brought up, I haven't seen Pete Alonso's stolen base total, but I can guarantee you it's negative six. So I'm going to take the. He's got he's, two he's good. positives at the very okay. least. So when he ends the year with three, I, I will, I will <laughs> be very impressed. Like, I, and I don't expect Freddie Freeman to steal 14 bases or anything like that. Um, of course it's not, it's always weird to me. Make the second half, like an actual second half, 81 and 81. Why don't you split the thing? Um, but yeah, I really do think that Freddie Freeman is going to be a superstar down the stretch. Pete Alonso is going to be good, but I've got Freddie Freeman, like, I really expect big things from him over these final two months. By the way, Freddie Freeman, seven stolen bases, zero caught stealing. Pete Alonso, nice. two stolen bases with a caught stealing in there. So basically He's running trying. around the base past that polar bear. Um, Good for him for say, trying. I, I agree. Look, I would say if if anyone out there agrees with you, and by the way, I think if you gave me a start from now to the end of the year, I'd probably take Freeman. I don't think it's as much of a gulp as you know as much of a difference as you kind of made as you might have alluded to at the beginning there i think pete alonzo's power is a hundred percent for real the rbis should be racked up it would not shock me if he was i mean, I, I think it would be the betting favorite to maybe lead the national league in rbis at the end of the year good i mean obviously the the mets roster around him the mets offense around him is a little bit more suspect and that's one of the reasons why i like freddie freeman a little bit more as well right just because of just the line of protection that he has out in la like if he picks up his game even five ten percent it's going to go a lot farther there than we're than pete alonso in new york um also just throwing out some of these stack casts i mean when we're talking about Freeman, Freeman's got what I mean, 98th percentile and expected batting average, 97th and expected weighted on base average, 96th and expected slugging. Like, right. even if the numbers aren't there, the back, uh, the you know, the stack cast numbers very much are. So, you just assume a little bit more good luck his way, all those numbers start running right to the green. So, right. I agree with you, Freddie Freeman, there. And if you happen to agree with us here, I think this is a trade that can vary that could get done in your fantasy leagues. Oh, for sure. If that's if you are so inclined. Like if you were yeah. to offer somebody Freddie Freeman for Pete Alonzo, maybe throw a couple make weights in there to to get it over the line. I think you could absolutely do that. And I think I would recommend to do so for the second half. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be as especially if somebody is really looking for that power edge. I mean, yeah. Pete Alonzo's power is that's prestigious and but Freddie Freeman is is not exactly a dink and dunk hitter there. Like so, so you're not going to be hurt in that category. I mean, you, this is just one of the best pure hitters in baseball. The Dodgers, I think the lineup is starting to get a little bit healthier. I'm a little worried about the Chris Taylor thing, but I would love to see like Miguel yeah. Vargas get a chance. These guys are hitting well below where Freddie Freeman is. It's about the right. fact that Mookie Betts and Trey Turner are hitting ahead of Freddie Freeman. You can't have any better than that. All due respect to what Alonso has done, I'm mm -hmm. just. I am all in on the Freddie Freeman hype train. All right. So let's flip over to uh, two of our young guns. I know you had them when we did our um, Cy Young Award, when we did our awards last week, and when we mm -hmm. spoke uh, about two weeks ago as well, when you were kind of naming your top five starting pitchers, you had both of them in there. Alec Manoa and Shane McClanahan, both making their uh, all-star game debuts. Um, it's very possible that, Either both of these guys will be on the short list to start the game as well. On top of that, the right. Noah nine and four with a two three four ERA and point nine eight WHIP. McClanahan nine and three with a one seven three ERA and point eight one WHIP. Manoa's got ninety seven strikeouts. McClanahan got, has one hundred forty one strikeouts, so he's been leading quite a bit in that category. Equal number of starts, nearly an equal number of innings. Chris, from here on out, name game me who you want rest of the season: Alec Manoa or Shane McClanahan. I mean, I hate taking someone other than Alec Manoa just because I like him so much. I can't take anybody but Shane McClanahan right now. I mean, the way this dude is missing anybody. bats. Right, should, is, I, should I open up this? Should I open well, up this? Well, and the, and the, and I would say in the American League. Okay. I will take, there's a few National League guys I might take over him. But in okay. the American League, I'm not sure I can take anybody over Shane McClanahan right now just the way he's missing because mm -hmm. of that, that swing and miss potential. Yeah. And, you know, the fact he is – my one concern might be that Tampa Bay might um, coddle him a little bit down the stretch, especially if they look like they're 
into a playoff thing. This is a very important part of their future. I don't think they want him throwing 180, 190 innings if they can avoid it. And that's one thing about Alec Manoa. I mean, we talked. I talked about this with Andrew Stoughton. That the comparison to CC Sabathia is legit. As these big, big yeah. guys who are just going to be durable as all get out. And Alec Manoa has been fantastic. I just in, because of the fantasy angle of it, and because of the swing and miss, I, I have to go with McClanahan. I think I'm going with McClanahan as well. I do worry about the innings, though. However, I was looking that up just to see, like, how many innings did he throw last year? Do I need to worry about, like, any type of innings cap? He actually threw more innings last year than Alec Manoa with 123. So if there was a world where they could bump him up to, like, 180, 190, I think that's still within the the realm of possibility in a world where Tampa Bay is fighting to get into the postseason. Yeah, and I, I mean, both both of the – sorry to interrupt, but both of those no. guys are, are playing for teams that are going to be, if not – not locks for playoffs, but very, very likely that right. at least one of them is making the playoffs. And certainly both of them are going to be fighting for the playoffs down the stretch. So that's a big thing going forward too. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, especially Tampa Bay can make moves for guys. They can do mm-hmm. pitching somebody as an opener ahead of the guy. I would guess that he's going to throw 150 to 60 innings. And I would guess Alec Manoa is going to get to that 180, 190. And that does matter. It is more production for you when these guys are on the bump. But, I mean, for now, <laughs> you, you just take what you're getting from Shane McClanahan, right. and you're just pleased as punch because, my goodness gracious, this guy's ability to miss bats, it's just exceptional. I I, I don't even need to bother with the baseball savant page. Yeah. The brightest of reds. Just yes. assume anything that I'm about to say is in the 96th or higher percentile. That's just I'm how surprised that he, I'm surprised his K percentage is only in the 98th. I'd be... <laughs> There's got to be relievers Relie- that are. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking of. It's yeah, the Clay because, Holmes's of the world just knocking yeah, everybody the, out. Yeah. The Andre Munoz and people like that there are probably is, yeah. going ahead. But man, that is super impressive for a starting pitcher to rank this high in so many categories. Well, more importantly, it's super impressive for any pitcher out there to be in the 98th percentile in K percentage and the 91st percentile in walk percentage. That's yeah. elite. <laughs> that is elite stuff while also elite command. And that is just an incredibly rare skill set to have. I agree with you. McClanahan rest of season. I think I, I still take him there. Um, the strikeouts just mean a little bit more for me at this point. I think I have a better chance of, even if maybe there's less innings, the strikeout should even it out. I think from a points league standpoint, I think they probably both even out at the end of the day, you're going to get more outs and more points from Manoa, but you'll get more strikeouts from McClanahan, just obviously just a smaller sample size. So you kind of have to weigh that, but I think at the end of the day, they pretty much wash each other out. Fair. All right, let's talk about two guys who both made the all-star team this year, but both will probably be wearing new uniforms come August 2nd, and that's Ian Happ and Andrew Benintendi. The two outfielders, uh, the two outfielders for the Cubs and Royals are uh, both very likely to be moved considering their strong performances in the first half and their teams going nowhere in the second. So right. Hap hitting 276 with eight homers and 40 RBIs, 39 runs scored and six stolen bases with an 818 OPS. Ben Intendi, more of the contact guy, 313 average with three homers, 35 RBIs, 35 runs scored, two stolen bases and a 780 OPS. So, Chris, if you are not only a fantasy manager, but also a GM of a of a contending team right now, sure. who are you pick in rest of season, Hap or Benintendi? Well, see, this is interesting because it's I think it's two different answers. If I'm picking okay. a GM real life, I'm taking Benintendi because I think his defense in left field is really, really good. And I think he's got a chance to hit for a high average, get on base. For fantasy, I'm going Hap in part because of, hey, Take a shot. Stolen bases. It is going to be a big thing with Ian Happ more. So he only is six compared to Benintendi's two. Andrew Benintendi has just never run despite the fact that he has well above average speed. We have seen Ian Happ, I mean, use his wheels a little bit more. And also the power difference here is significant. Like Andrew Benintendi is as, as nice as that 313 average and 384 on base percentages. A 396 slugging percentage is tough. Like that's not something that you're really looking for in the fantasy 
uh, especially from an outfielder. You know, if this is your second baseman or, or a catcher or right. something like that, you can deal with that with 313. Yeah. From the outfield, it's a little tougher. Now, I'm not saying that you don't roster Andrew Benintendi. And I will also say this. We have seen Ian Happ have extreme highs and some of the lowest gosh dang lows that you can possibly have from a fantasy baseball player. And you have to be cognizant of that. But I'll take the upside of the power and a little better chance of stolen bases from Happ. Um, but Andrew Benintendi is certainly a nice player as well. Okay, I'm going to caveat my answer as well. I would take Benintendi, if we're talking a points league, I think I take Benintendi in a sure. in a roto league. I think I'm taking Hap. Like you mentioned, with Hap, you have the stolen bases. Obviously, that's a major factor that plays more in a roto than it does in a points. Um, Benintendi, on the other hand, it, it, he just doesn't strike out. This is a guy who there's no negative points on the yeah. points base side. So having all of that to go along with an average that gets on there now, theoretically insert him into a lineup that has a, that towards the top of a lineup that has a bunch of, you know, help around him. Suddenly those runs jump up a whole bunch. That batting average helps even more on that category. So I'd probably say in a points league, I might take Ben Intendi, but in a Roto league, Hap's ability for, and it's not very often there are guys that can do this, but like guys, Hap's ability to give you a combo meal on any given night is something right. that is just super valuable. And uh, I mean, it's a short list of players that can do that. Hap is one of them. So I'd probably take Hap in there. But again, both of these guys, it should be very curious when we look back at this conversation four months from now, when they get moved and they go to a new place and, and they make a name for themselves there. I think it's going to be very interesting when we look back at this. Great, great call. I will say this with Ian Happ, though, for for like an in points league. Yeah, he strikes out quite a bit. He does kind of make up for it with walks. He's in the 85th yes. percentile in base on ball percentage. So you will get some some help there. That That is nice. But it's a great point about the fact that Andrew Benintendi is one of the more difficult hitters to strike out. And unfortunately, that hurts him in the roto wire or it hurts him in the roto yet because uh, shout out roto wire. They do great work as well. Um, they, uh, it hurts him because his swing is so conducive to contact that it's really taken away the power that we were expecting to see from him when he was literally the very best prospect in baseball. But, uh, yep. but yeah, that's a, that's a good call in, in a, in a, a league where on base percentage matters and strikeouts are going to hurt you at that I think that Ben and is a pretty good call there. All right, let's move on to another all-star versus snub here. Luis Arias, welcome to the all-star team and well-deserved as well. Yeah. He's only batting 348, the purest, the purest of C-ball hit ball players out there. 348 yeah. with four home runs, 29 RBIs, two stolen bases, and 50 runs scored, an OPS of 869. Meanwhile, Ty France. Um, doing great things as well. An OPS of 839 with 10 homers, 45 RBIs, a 306 average, and 32 runs scored. Uh, obviously, Arias makes the all-star team. Ty France on the outside looking in. Right. I know as a Mariner fan, that must rile you with rage. But <laughs> from a fantasy perspective, who are you taking from now to the end of the year, Arias or France? Okay, so let me get on the uh, – uh what is it called again? The soapbox? Yeah, the yeah. soapbox real quick here and talk to some Mariner fans that no, <laughs> Ty France did not deserve to go over Lisa Arias. It sucks that, that it sucks that he is considered a first baseman. It is the position he's played the most, but he's played all over. Like he's been at first base. He's been at second base. He's, he is Ty France is a more pure first baseman. And if that's the way you want to view it, that, they should go to the all-star game. Well, then you're an idiot because it's just based on putting together the best roster. And Louise Arias is having a better year than Ty France. Having said that, I want Ty France on my fantasy roster just because of the fact that as much as I love Luis Arias, he's one of my favorite players. He's just, you are so reliant on batting average with this guy. There is just zero power his hard hit percentage is in the bottom 13th now he's also in the 95th and expected batting average now 100th in both k and whiff percentage and he has a very good approach to the plate so in in those points leagues that that's a nice thing to have especially mm -hmm. for the fact that he just doesn't strike out ty france is going to hit for a high average and for power though and going to get a chance to drive in runs so because i think that ty france is going to help in more categories 
I want him on my fantasy roster, but this one hurts me because I have been in love with the other guy for a very long time. I agree with you here. I uh, literally on most of your points. I love Arias. Absolutely love him. I just, yeah. I love the old school style that he plays the game where it's just, sure. it's not launch angles. It's not exit velo. It's not all the rest of that stuff. It's just right. Where's the ball. I'm going to hit it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would take Ty France from a fantasy perspective as well. And that is because like you said, Arias is very much a one category kind of like stupendous guy. Yeah. But the drop off between his batting average and Ty France's batting average is not enough for me to negate the power that Ty France can bring to the conversation. Hundred percent. If we were talking about two different players, we might have a different conversation here, but the fact Mm -hmm. that Ty France is still a 300 hitter who has a batting average in the, an expected batting average in the 81st percentile and his K percentage is in the 89th percentile. Like right. he also doesn't strike out very much. So whether your points or Roto, I, I still think the gap between the two is just uh, the difference between batting average is just not, is too close for that difference in power that Ty France can give to you on that spot. Plus, I, I mean, both of them, what is really nice, depending on your league, both of them have a nice positional flexibility depending on, you know, how your league makes that work. But honestly, when thinking about these two, I kind of started to think that I think now that we have an official DH, a universal DH, and now the NL has DH voting in the conversation when it comes to All-Stars, I think we genuinely should have like a utility voting spot. Yep. Just like one of those guys who just like the DJ LeMay Hughes and, you know, the Ty Francis, Luis Arises, like all these guys who jump all over the place, don't play one position wholeheartedly, but they sure. do so well at everything the, you know, the old Ben Zobrist type. Like, right. I think we need to have that spot somewhere in the voting process because I think it's incredibly difficult to, when you put Ty France against first baseman, we, he's never going to beat Vlad Jr. for the spot. Like, it's no. never a conversation that's going to be had. But yeah. if suddenly there was a utility spot that we could vote on a couple guys for, I think that'd be a really interesting conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And it would be, you know, just something fun to do. And I know baseball likes to uh, not embrace the fun so much um yeah but it would be nice to see something like that yeah it would be fun because look calling luis areas a first baseman is um misleading i think because because he's literally (laughs) played he has played more games there and more innings there than any other position but if you take everything else he's done like he is more something else than first baseman. So, and by the way, I will point this out with France as well. Like he got off to a rip roaring start and has yeah. kind of slowed down a little bit. Some of it, a little bit due to injury and some of the fact that you just can't stay that hot forever. And I also say this long-term because of the fact that Ty France is playing nothing else, but first base. Now he was a terrible defensive second baseman. Um, he is locked in. Yeah. The metrics don't like his defensive first base this year, but he was one of the best first basemen in baseball last year. I believe he won the gold glove, which means nothing. But it is something to keep in mind that Luis Arias is going to have that multiple positional flexibility going right. forward. And Ty France is first base and first base only. So the value for this year, it's great that you can put him at second base. It's never going to happen again. Right. Uh, let's talk about um, two guys who also hit in the All-Star game who are unexpected names to do so. Welcome to the All-Star team, Martin Perez and Paul Blackburn, two yeah. veteran arms who are well, – it's hard for me to say Paul Blackburn's a veteran arm. All right, so Martin Perez is a veteran arm. Paul Blackburn yes, is. is still very much in the in the prime of his career. But both of these guys, neither expected to be on this roster at the beginning of the season, both having very special years right now. Paul Blackburn – um, six and four with a three, three, six ERA with 91, uh, 73 strikeouts and 91 innings. Uh, Martin Perez, seven and two with a two, seven, two ERA, uh, and 86 strikeouts across 106 innings pitch with a 1.18 whip. Uh, both of these guys have been very good this year, both doing it with not overpowering stuff. If you were to ha- if you had to pick one for your fantasy roster from now to the end of the year, which one are you back up? No, thank you. Um, I I would go with You're not Blackburn. bad enough. They're on all-star yeah. teams. There's no Look, no thank no. you here. You take yeah, one of them. Yeah, here's here's what, the thing. I have zero faith in either one of these guys being successful for the rest of the season because of some of the stats that you read. Like, look, missing bats matters. And it's not just from the fantasy perspective. It's from the real-life perspective. There is a reason why 
the, the most important stats have become strikeouts. It is the thing that you are controlling yourself. Having said that, if I'm going to pick one of these two, I'll go with Blackburn because I think there's a better chance that he is playing for a contender. The A's suck out loud. Just an awful baseball team, an embarrassingly bad baseball team that needs to uh, – yeah, it's, it's just not fun. I feel bad for all of my Oakland fans. Shout out to Ryan Thibodeau, one of my favorite people in the world. But, man, the baseball team that you root for is just god-awful. Um, so the fact that he got, has a chance to pitch somewhere. Look, Martin Perez has not had an ERA below 4.34 since 2013. Yeah. That is not a small sample size here. And it, shout out to him for being excellent this year. I mean, truly was putting up some unbelievable numbers. Like you could argue that he was like the Cy Young of the first month and a half. Like he was yeah. that good. It's gone a little haywire a little bit. And I have zero doubt that it's going to go haywire down the stretch pitching for, especially in those hot summer months, pitching in Texas, he's going to wear down. He, he, he you know, I, I'm not rooting for an injury or anything like that, but that's just how this works. I'll take Blackburn just because of the fact that I think he might give you some six inning three run starts for somebody else. But um, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, no, give me Blackburn as well here. And it's mainly because I just, it's less me believing in Paul Blackburn long-term and it's more me believing that Martin Perez is is about to fall off a cliff. Uh, I mean, just the last few starts have not been particularly good. Um, If I'm looking at this now, um, given up, Six yeah, runs in his last, three in the one prior to that, four in the one prior to that, a couple good starts, and then seven in the one prior to that. So it's been it's been a couple uh, bad starts in a row. Also, right. Martin Perez, because he's kind of fluctuated and now the bullpen, uh, not always not always being a starter everywhere he goes. Um, he's at 106 innings right now. He hasn't pitched over 114 since 2019, and oh, that was when he threw 160. So like, I just think eventually, very similar. Well. Not similar in the sense that I think the the fall off is coming when it comes to when I've been talking about um, Tony Gonsolin and just the innings, the obvious innings issues that he had. His career high is fifty, and he's at over a hundred right now. Like I, I assume that that is there's going to be some wear and tear on him as the season progresses. Martin Perez, I think we're already starting to see it. Um, I think this is your last chance if you want to try and to sell high in any way, shape, or form to put him up with anybody else. I think, honestly, both of these guys would be great sell-high candidates. You can say, hey, they're an all-star. Hey, you know, they've had really good first halves. Put them in with somebody else and try and see if you can do a two-for-one and get a better pitcher out the deal. I'd be totally fine with either of those. But, yes, I, I think Paul Blackburn has a better chance of keeping up some version of this success than Martin Perez, who I think, like, I, I agree with you there. I think the train is, is starting to come off the tracks. Um, how can you go, hey, now you're an all-star and not do the Smash Mouth thing, Colin? Like, it, it, it took a lot inside of me not to do that. I I, maybe, honest. I wish you could have just said that, like, we just don't have the rights to the song. that we. Oh, we that's we also answer. fair. And you know what? I wasn't <laughs> thinking that. And I'm just about to play chess and I play checkers, sir. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, let's move on to Jock Peterson. I mean, the 30-year-old who has, I mean, he just had a tremendous year so far. Uh, been 256 with 17 homers, 41 RBIs, 35 runs scored, an OPS of 861 with three swipes in the process. I'm going to put him up against, and we're, we're going to name game this in a little bit more of a way, but I'm going to put this him up against basically every outfielder that has been on the All-Star team. Obviously, Jock Peterson making the starting getting one of the starting positions voted into the starting lineup, but a lot of really good outfielders on the reserves here. And I mean, really, if we're talking for the rest of season, uh, let me see if I'm looking at the rest of the, where am I at? The rest of the outfielders here. We're talking Byron Buxton as a really, uh, as a reserve. We're talking Kyle Schwarber as a reserve. We're talking, um, where is the rest of them? Oh, there we are. Uh, we're talking Juan Soto as a reserve. We're talking Starling Marte as a reserve. So literally up against every outfielder, and I will put Ben Benintendi. So let's start the talk. Are you taking Jock Peterson over Hap and Ben Benintendi? No. No, you're not even not. We're not even starting no. there. Okay. Who yeah. would you take over Hap? I mean, who would you take over Peterson from those two? 
Uh, I think both. It, it's both. not that okay. it's nothing against Jock Peterson. It's the thing that we talked about when Jock Peterson got off to this just sensational start. Left-handed pitching, man. He mm-hmm. he has not shown that yeah. he can do it in the long term, and that's a big big blow. There is a chance that he's going to be a platoon player down the stretch and you have to absolutely mollywop the baseball in order to be a person that I'm taking over those type of guys as a platoon player. So let me ask you the question that, I mean, again, expanding this out, I thought those might've been the two that I want to at least set a baseline. Before. Sure. But if you're not, if those two aren't, would you, is he the lowest rated outfielder fantasy wise in on both all-star teams starting and reserves from here to the end of the season? I think so. And look, this is, this is the opposite of darning with faint praise. You know what I mean? Like he has earned the right to, I mean, he's also earned the right by being a very popular player in a very popular market to make the all-star team. Let's be honest about that as well. Um, This is a player who this is the first season that he's had an OPS above 850 Mm -hmm. since 2019. And there's an awful lot of 700 and 600 seasons in between it's she has not been a very consistent baseball player but you know he the the power has been legit he has probably helped fantasy players a lot more than he's hurt but there's just no reason for me to believe he is much closer to the guy who posted a 732 ops to me than the guy who posted an 861 ops like there's just it's very cool that he made the all-star game. He's the, the pearls and all of that stuff are <laughs> very fun. They don't help you win fantasy baseball games. And I just can't trust him. A guy I love for DFS, especially when you're playing against like a right-hander, right. that's, yeah. that's a great guy to have in the lineup. But uh, it's just hard for me to believe that he can sustain this level of success. I think I still take him over Hap and Benintendi. I think the season that he's having, and also there's a, I mean, there's a chance he gets moved as well. Uh, I mean, I think I'd probably take him over Happ and Ben and Tendi, but after that, I think that's where the conversation ends. Um, they're just, I mean, looking through this outfield reserve group, I mean, the outfield reserve group is incredible. I mean, yeah. on, the, on the National League, it's Soto, Schwarber, Marte, uh, Happ, and on the American League, it's um, Springer, Buxton, Tucker, and Julio Rodriguez. I mean, yeah, they're just, it's, it's just so good. Yeah, um, so yeah, no, good. I agree. I agree with that spot there. I mean, I would probably keep him over Ben Intendi and, uh, Hap, but otherwise Jack Peterson, I, that's why I had to phrase it this way. Like Jack Peterson verse, because yeah. honestly for a starter in the all-star game, I, I, I have him as my third to last outfielder for the remainder of the season. Yeah. And a part of this also is me like, so he got off to a 1.127 OPS in April and March. So that was only yeah, 16 games. Unbelievable. But, yeah. 848 OPS in May is very good, even though it was with a 221 average. He was very good in June um, with a 274, 346, 534 line. That's an 880 OPS. That's very good. Um, I have happened to cover a few games in July. Not so great. 129, 222, 194. Yeah. That's a 416 OPS. It's also an incredibly small sample size. But but the big concern here is, I mean, you look at the split versus left-handers and versus right-handers. 892 OPS versus right-handers, 673 yeah. against left-handers, and it's all of 34 plate appearances. He's mm-hmm. just not going to be in the lineup enough for me to put him over those guys. Um, although I will, I would not be shocked if when we eventually get the home run derby group that he's not a part of it because oh, me he, too. Seems, he seems to love that oh, being yeah. a part of that event, and he's a starter in the all-star game. This feels like something that needs to happen. Well, he's on my fantasy league too. So that'll be, a, he, he's, he's going to be one of my guys with the, uh, we're, we're starting a new league with him and Tommy fam is just going to be the three of us. And it's going to be a lot of fun. If you got any space on that league, I want to, no, no, that's fine. Then just let me, <laughs> as long as you give me access to the, as long as you yeah. give me access to the, uh, to the message boards, that's all I really need. I don't really care anything more past that. Absolutely. Let's have a conversation. I got, I want two more to end with quickly here. Let's have a conversation. I think that's just fascinating. Um, well, hold on. Do you want to do relievers or do you want to do third baseman? 
Uh, I never want to do anything having to do with relievers. That's what I, I thought we, so as well. I All right, think, let's so do. So let's do third baseman. Yeah. Yes, let's do. I, I think this is just fascinating from not only this All Star game and for the remainder of the year, but also where we're talking about drafting them next year. And that's the top two third baseman in the American League between Rafael Devers and Jose Ramirez. Mm. Devers gets the starting nod over Ramirez. I assume a large part of that is a raucous group from. New England rooting, <laughs> voting him in versus Jose Ramirez and uh, the good yeah. people of Cleveland and the greater Ohio area. But, sure. um, I mean, really, it's hard to argue the point either way. I, I think this is really six one half dozen the other, the way how good Rafael Devers has been and how good Jose Ramirez has been. Um, if you were to have one of these guys for the remainder of the year and you want both of them because, I mean, really, we're talking about two first-round picks next year probably – who are you taking from now to the end? It's going to be Ramirez for me, but this has become so much closer than it was yeah. a month and a half ago. Like for a long time, Jose Ramirez was the clear cut fantasy MVP. And the reason he's not is more about the fact how good the big three of Goldschmidt, Judge, and Jordan Alvarez have been right. more than – and Rafael Devers is right in that conversation mm -hmm. as well. Um, if you go by current rankings in Yahoo, Jose Ramirez is currently ranked sixth among all players, including pitchers. Rafael Devers is currently ranked eighth. I think you're more likely to see uh, Devers help in the average category, and I think the power category might be his as well. Stolen bases, man. It's a big thing. He has stolen 13 bases, and Rafael Devers has stolen two. In a points league, this is pretty close, except Jose Ramirez, I think, as even though Devers has a higher on base percentage, I expect Jose Ramirez to, especially because of what's going on in Cleveland right now, they got off to that real nice start, and mm -hmm. there's just no reason to pitch to Jose Ramirez right now. No. I think the walks are going to go – way up for him and then that hopefully leads to more stolen base attempts as well i love rafi devers i cannot wait to see him get the bag hopefully it's from boston because i'd love to see him spend his whole career and if you're trading mookie bets for financial flexibility pretty good person to use financial flexibility yeah, on in, in yeah. rafi devers <laughs> but I, i'll just go with jose ramirez just because i think five category player compared to four I'm going to go with Devers here. And yes, your stolen bases are absolutely a valid point. And I, I take nothing apart from that. But I will say Ramirez, for a guy who is, again, putting up great numbers, uh, two, 288 average, 17 home runs, 68 RBIs, 50 runs, a 942 OPS, phenomenal numbers. Um, an average exit velocity in the 26th percentile, hard hit in the 36th percentile, barrel percentage in the 37th. It, if anything, you can make the argument that if he gets back to more standard numbers, his his numbers should jump off the page. Last year, those uh, respectively 66, 60, and 73, that was his numbers last year. So assuming that he gets back to that, this is probably a Jose Ramirez conversation. But Rafael Devers has just been absolutely flawless all year, basically with a bat in his hand. The only issue has been just slight like health knocks on him, but otherwise doing everything right, 94 third and above in basically every single stack cast category with a bat in his hand that isn't running or, uh, or fielding. So I might take Devers this year. Cause I think it just feels like a special Devers year, the way that he's playing. Um, we talk obviously going into drafts next year, the stolen base conversation is going to keep Jose Ramirez ahead of him in a Roto league in a points league. Like you said, I think we're almost at the point of negating the, the lead that Jose Ramirez had entering the year almost there. We got to finish out the year first, but Devers at age 25 doing what he's doing right now. This is a special player and I might take Devers from now to the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I wouldn't say it's like insane. The one thing that I think you got to keep in mind here with Devers is he still has such a middling approach at the plate that you're going to see some average regression. Now, he is one of the best bad ball hitters in baseball, yeah. and the ball just what jumps does. off dude's bat. It's also he's helped by that green monster. I mean, he literally should own that thing at this point, like so many balls yeah. that he's hit off of that thing from his left-handed bat. And, I mean, like you said, the metrics are impressive. I will say this with Jose Ramirez, though, again, too. I think people need to remember – how much better this guy has played in second halves of season. And this is, you know, for a lot of guys, that's a silly stat. 
there's been too much of this from Jose right. Ramirez over where he is a guy who is like, are you worried about Jose Ramirez too? Oh, he finished in the top three in MVP again. Like this is something that is routinely happened with him. But look, it, it's certainly possible. Rafael Devers is only 25 years old. And it's funny 25. saying that because it seems like he's been around forever. Like I swear he was a part of that 2008 world championship team somehow as an 11 year old. Like it doesn't, it just seems like he has been playing for so long, but yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it that Rafael Devers has as much fantasy upside as any type of player. And it's just amazing how much things drop with all due respect to Manny Machado after that, who's been very good. The drop yeah. between I'll say even those three uh, for the third base position is just so precipitous. Uh, by the way, he played 58 games as a 20 year old in 2017. That's wow. how, that's how, that's how long ago we've had to to dust that one off starting yeah. at 20 and doing a very nice job in the process. For sure. Um, let's end with a fun one here, just because this is the first time since the nineties that we've had the scenario go down. Welcome to the starting nods, both Contreras brothers, Wilson and William for the Cubs and um, Braves, both getting the starting nod. Uh, William Contreras getting the nod over Bryce Harper, who was voted in as the DH. He's going to replace him in the starting lineup. First, first brothers to do that to make the starting lineup since the Alomar brothers back in the nineties. Uh, obviously different. I mean, these are different players and Contreras is really more of a DH, although he does have catcher eligibility in most leagues. Wilson Contreras, obviously a catcher only all, probably on the move too. If you had to pick one for the rest of the year, are you taking the big brother or the little brother? I'll go big bro. Just because I think little bro is going to have some ups and downs as a rookie. Like, I know it's technically not his rookie season. It might as well be. It's his first full year as a professional baseball player. I mean, I, I like him long-term an awful lot. And I think that long-term he's going to be probably the backstop there. I mean, Travis Darnot is a, is a nice player, but I would imagine the most value that you get out of William Contreras is a backstop. I also love the fact that Wilson Contreras is like a, a foregone conclusion, I would say at this point to be playing for a new team by the end of he's August. Got his and, pack. He's yeah. Just I mean, for the phone call. And, yeah. and he has been so good this year, especially in points leagues because his approach, I mean, yes. I guess that's one thing that might concern me a little bit that like, there is no reason to pitch to Wilson Contreras right now because of how bad that Chicago Cubs lineup, if he goes, you get the better and the better with that because you'll right. get a chance to drive in more guys playing for the better team. But like he has earned his number, uh, Hard hit percentage, 93rd percentile, expected weighted on base average, 91st percentile. It's been very encouraging as a guy that I had as a top 75 prospect in William Contreras to be performing so well. But I think that we'll, so we will see some ups and downs from a rookie hitter, while uh, Wilson Contreras, I think, provides a much higher floor. Yeah, it's big brother here for obvious reasons. I mean, he's been around a lot longer and rookie slumps occur in the second half of the year. Oh, yeah. So yeah, no, it's it's big brother there, but it's a fun conversation to have just obviously because of the two of them. And like you said, sure. welcome to a new team, Wilson Contreras. Like he will be on a new roster in a couple of weeks. He's got bags packed, he's just waiting for the phone call. And you got to assume that when he moves to a, a good roster, say an Astros team that is getting nothing from that catcher position. Yeah, that's uh, a I great mean, call. imagine putting Wilson Contreras on that. Astros team, him batting like the five, six hole on that. I mean, everything goes up. So yeah. um, I would say if anything, I'm not sure you can buy low on Wilson Contreras at this point. Cause he's been catcher one for basically sure. the entire year. But if there ever was a time for you to try and potentially snake, this is the time because I think as soon as he moves teams and puts on a different uniform, I mean, he might, he, he I think can absolutely jump off the way that he's hitting the ball. A hundred percent. By the way, I will say another good fit for Wilson Contreras would be Seattle, who has gotten yep. somehow back into this playoff thing. They're literally tied for the wild card spot. I, I was thinking about this the other day. Cal Rowley has been one of the better catchers in baseball over the last couple of months. Don't take a look at the overall numbers because he got off mm -hmm. to such a bad start. Um, but he has been outstanding. But a Cal Rowley and some prospects for Wilson Contreras trade might make an awful lot of sense like wow. the, the Cubs get their catcher of the future they get some prospects for a guy who's going to leave and by the way I don't think people are appreciating enough that Cal Raleigh's nickname is Big Dumper 
I did not know. I honestly did not know that. And that's you're great. very welcome. That is that is great. And I <laughs> and I need to put safe search on so I can look up the history of that. <laughs> that's a good call. That's a good call. But that just about finishes up our what show. What a way to finish today. that show. Thank you. Enjoy you're the welcome. show. Well, make sure you are subscribed or ever you listen to your podcast so you don't miss an episode. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, please be sure to rate and review us. And while you're at it, be sure to follow NBC Sports Edge on Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch to be informed of all of our live shows, Q&As, segments, articles, and more so you can keep up to date on everything around the league and join in on the action. You can follow me on Twitter at Kyle Don't Lie, and you can follow Chris at Crawford underscore M-I-L-B. Be sure to tune back in tomorrow as Chris invites ESPN's Kylie McDaniels onto the pod to discuss the upcoming MLB draft and all of the prospects involved, so make sure you don't miss it. So until then, stay safe out there. And as always, thanks for the listen. I'll take Dom Smith over Paul Blackburn. Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for all the latest fantasy and sports betting advice from NBC Sports Edge. And don't forget to sign up for NBC Sports Edge Plus to get the best in class draft guides, as well as season long fantasy, DFS and sports betting tools that will give you the edge.